injury um, and cardiac arrhythmia as, as far as uh, uh, patients that have such injuries go. Um, and I'd like to preface my talk by, for the past 25 years, I've taken care of traumatic brain injury patients. Um, and we've noticed that these patients all develop dysrhythmias of different natures. And we became very interested in the cardiac status of these patients, because even when they had Glasgow coma scores of 14, 15, normally the patient would be transferred to the floor. But in the face of that type of injury, uh, we started noticing that these patients were developing dysrhythmias even on telemetry or, or in the ICU. So we started putting all these patients in our ICU so that we could better understand what was going on. And when we did our analysis, I'll show you what we found. Next slide, please. Okay. I think everyone here knows how significant traumatic brain injury is. It's one of the leading causes of mortality. Um, as far as ad adults and children. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have any primary treatment for these patients. Uh, and because of that, um, we're mostly supportive care and we need to be monitoring these patients more closely. So um, TBI associated hospitalizations as well as ER visits are increasing with the knowledge that people are understanding that this is a more significant issue than it would seem at, at, at outset. Oh, he just got a little concussed or a little, um, you know, small head injury. It's not like that anymore. People are starting to understand this. And again, the number of post-admission TBI have also increased. So we're watching these patients patients are dying under our watch. So the exact mechanism is really unclear as to what's going on. We're going to talk about this. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. Okay. So there is, there has been an increasing evidence of association between traumatic brain injury and the development of abnormal heart rhythms. No question about it, okay? And that's been developing over the last two decades now. Um, it's not clear why. Um, and there's been a couple of proposed theories. There is dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, imbalance of sympathetic and parasympathetics, which cause arrhythmias, certainly structural damage uh, to the heart related to inflammatory mediators and oxidative stress uh, that can be induced by traumatic brain injury. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. So, and in 2019, the American Heart Association Journal published that TBI was associated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. Now, atrial fibrillation has been a, a hot topic for a lot of people, no? And with the emergence of electrophysiology as a uh, subset of how cardiology patients are managed, um, the interest in atrial fibrillation has significantly increased. And to that, traumatic brain injury has been associated more with atrial fibrillation. Um, but also not just atrial fibrillation, but ventricular arrhythmias were already noticed as of 2017. So really speaking, we've known about this for a while. People have published it, but no one really took up the, the association and said, okay, what do we need to do with this? And how are we going to address this? And again, um, there, the implications of these arrhythmias are significant. You do have increased risk of stroke, increased heart failure, and other serious complications. So we have to pay attention. Next slide. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so in order to better characterize these associations, what we did was there's a huge database in the United States called the National Inpatient Sample. And the National Inpatient Sample is all admissions to most hospitals in the United States. And what we did was we gained access through the government website. And what we were able to do is after gaining access, we ran a couple of programs to look at specifically traumatic brain injury and the presence of um, uh, cardiac arrhythmias and what type of cardiac arrhythmia. So we went through that. So again, um, most sizable all payer inpatient database in the United States. Again, they collect about 7 million hospital visit information annually. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we did was we identified involving traumatic hemorrhage subdural hematoma and subarachnoid hemorrhage. So we looked at all the different types of severe closed head injury that we can find. And then what we did was we identified those with a diagnosis of the cardiac dysrhythmias uh, that we've listed, VTAC, uh, sick sinus syndrome, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, um, supraventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and or atrioventricular block. So we have a look at these things. So let's let's see what we found. Next slide. Okay. So we did our statistical analysis using Stata 16.1. Model. And for those of you that are familiar with statistics, um, this is a good way for us to look for association. And that's what we were looking for. We were looking for correlation coefficients, and we were looking at groups less than age 40 or 40 years are great and greater. And this was purely arbitrary um, because we were looking at younger patients and slightly older patients to see how the difference would be. Next slide. Okay, so we looked at 110,000 patients with traumatic brain injury between 2016 and 2017. The average population age was about 58 years of age. Okay, so when you combined both groups, but we separated them out and we kind of looked at different things. Let's go through the data. Next slide. Okay, so we had about almost 70% that were male and about almost 30%, you know, that were female. So we were, we did have a more male population than we did female population. Next slide. Okay, so for patients under age 40, we were looking at arrhythmias that were more commonly seen with traumatic cerebral uh, issues and subarachnoid hemorrhage. So with TCE, we noticed that there was, you notice the odds uh, ratio really very high for VFID, sudden cardiac death. So when you're looking at these patients, uh, patients under age 40, relatively young patients, no cardiac history to speak of. Now you're looking at that patient that suffered, you know, subarachnoid hemorrhage or TC. And the problem is, is even if their Glasgow coma score is normal, the problem is, is they can have ventricular fibrillation as a, as a complication during their hospital stay. So you really have to think about it. And again, sick sinus syndrome, look at how often we see that. Brady arrhythmias, 
atrial fibrillation, you notice all these odds ratios, by the way, the odds ratio of one means it can happen purely by chance. Odds ratio of greater than one tells us that, hey, this is a higher risk than the general population and the odds ratio is increasing. There must be some association there. So this is what we were looking at. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. So with subarachnoid hemorrhage, you notice that ventricular tachycardia is a major, major player and ventricular fibrillation. So really speaking, oftentimes these patients, if you have a patient under age 40, even with a small subarachnoid hemorrhage, you know, with the normal looking GCS, that patient needs to be in the intensive care unit or at least a monitored telemetry unit where you're watching to look for VTAC or VFib or supraventricular tachycardia. So you're looking for this. When you'll notice that while people talked about atrial fibrillation, the odds ratio wasn't that high, but still it's something to keep in mind. In younger patients, it's even more so. The older patients we were seeing, there is an association, but the association the odds ratios are not nearly as high. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But I want you to understand, these are young patients. You wouldn't think they have cardiac risk, but they do. So we have to take this seriously. Next slide, please. Okay, so if they're over age 40, what happens more commonly from subdural hematoma? And we see that very often in elderly patients that fall and hit their head. So these patients develop issues with sick sinus syndrome, atrial fibrillation, bradyrrhythmias, or even complete heart block. But you notice the odds ratio is not that significant because the problem is, is the issue here for us is to separate out the traumatic brain injury issue versus their own intrinsic cardiac problems. So that's why a lot of these patients do develop cardiac issues, but we cannot attribute it only to the traumatic brain injury. So that's why the odds ratios come down. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you look at this slide, this is, I know, a busy slide, but what it does is under age 40, you notice there's a prevalence for VTAC, VFib, six sinus syndrome. There is a prevalence there, right? And no matter what type of brain injury you have, there is an increased odds ratio that you're going to have a problem with this. So you have to think along those lines. So when you're managing a younger patient, you don't have, you cannot just say, well, I'm just going to do neuro checks every two hours and put them on the ward or the neuro, neuro step down unit. You need to watch their monitor. You need to watch how their rhythm status is changing. Next slide, please. So again, over age 40, you notice the odds ratios are pretty level, you know, in the types of dysrhythmias and stuff that we see. And the reason for that is the intrinsic issues that these patients will encounter is related to their own heart issues that are going to be there. And you're going to see that the odds ratios will be much more tame as compared to the patients under, under age 40. So, but that doesn't mean they're going to have less dysrhythmias. It just means that the attribu attributability of the dysrhythmia to the TBI will be significantly less because their own intrinsic heart has that risk. So that's something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So again, TBI is not just about the brain. Please understand this. There is a multifaceted response to injury that we see in our patients. And what we see is elevation of catecholamines. We, we sometimes see sympathetic storms that, you know, you'll notice that the patient all of a sudden goes into a problematic situation. 
And that can be due to catecholamine surges that happen in traumatic brain injured patients. We see multiple different arrhythmias. And again, arrhythmias seem to be present in all age groups. We're not just talking about isolated elderly patients only. We are really talking about the issue of looking at these patients much more closely. All age groups need to be monitored. Comorbid condition monitoring in patients over age 40 is absolutely essential. And in fact, you know, I would go as far as saying, even if it seems like a relatively minor traumatic brain injury, these patients need to be watched very closely for at least two to three days so that we can make sure that these type of dysrhythmias do not happen because unmonitored cardiac arrhythmias lead to increased mortality. And that's the problem. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello, next slide, please. Okay. I think we have we 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 have some time for questions. Um, any questions? Um, I know this is a this is a interesting area um, to think about, and I want people to really pay close attention to patients with traumatic brain injury. Um, and once traumatic brain injury has been identified, um, we really need to be thinking um, along those lines. Again, patients under age 40, watch for VFib. Patients over age 40, many different arrhythmias are seen and monitoring is vital. And please remember, that you know we need to we need to make sure these people are monitored and otherwise we're going to continue to see increased mortality rate in traumatic brain injury patients. Okay. 